So we're going to look at some of the lessons from the life of George Washington. He was eulogized by Light Horse Harry Lee, who was one of his comrades and the, and the father of Robert E. Lee. He was first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. But the truth is, before he could become all those things, he had to overcome some serious deficiencies in his education. And he had to overcome a lot of failures. And so today I want to dig into this and look at both his educational deficiencies and look at some of the failures he had to overcome. And we're going to begin with his educational deficiencies. The fact is, Washington is not a thinker. He's not a writer, right? And as a matter of fact, Washington, uh, after the Revolutionary War, he's so embarrassed <clears throat> by his writing ability that with some aids, he goes back and he takes all his childhood writings and all every letter that he can get his hands on, and he goes through and he proofreads it and rewrites it because he's so embarrassed by his lack of ability to spell um, and, and just basically to make a, a cogent sentence. And I mean, Washington does not compare to any of the great men of this era in terms of intellect. What I want us to look at, though, is his educational uh, shortcomings don't define who he is. And so let's go back to his childhood and dig in a little bit. We're going to start with what's called the rules of civility. There were 110 rules of civility that children were supposed to memorize. And I, I got to tell you, I think it's a lost art today, memorization, uh, because of, of this thing. It's, it's interesting. I've been looking at some studies doing brain imagery. And the brain imagery seems to be showing that there aren't connections happening in the brain where they used to happen. Uh, just a generation ago, that this generation, because they're using their phones so much, think about how many times when you were growing up, somebody said, what's, you know, what's the state of this? Or what's the answer to this? And then you would impress people with your knowledge. There's no impressing anymore. I, I mean, I, I don't know how many times somebody will go to ask me and say, well, what's the, and then they go, never mind. And then they just go to their phone. Well, they're not developing that muscle. This generation did 110 rules of civility. This idea of civility comes from the rule of St. Matthew, do it to others as you would have them do unto you. And it really takes off in the medieval period. Um, they want to be civilized, right? They don't want to be barbarians. And so they really get into what's going to make us civilized. So things like uh, maybe we shouldn't spit across the table anymore. Maybe when I spit, I shouldn't spit near your, your feet. They just begin to be cognizant of this. Now, we in the United States of America, we're slow learners. We don't really overcome our spitting habits until the 20th century. As a matter of fact, if you go into the U.S. Capitol, even in the 20th century, there's spittoons everywhere, right? And no one thinks anything of it. For my generation, of course, it was ashtrays were everywhere. Right? But for them, spitting was just part of life. But George Washington knew better because he'd read these rules of civility. So I want to look at just three uh, of these rules of civility. And we're going to start with number 15. It says, keep your nails clean and short, <laughs> also your hands and teeth clean, yet without showing any great concern for them. In other words, hygiene matters. They're beginning to wake up that hygiene matters, right? but not so much that you're a narcissist and looking at yourself in the mirror all the time. That'll come a little later in history, right? But at this point, it's don't show up at formal things and, and you're dirty, right? Show up with some cleanliness and, and Washington takes this to heart. So I wanna come to 100 because I tie these two together. It says, cleanse not your teeth with a tablecloth. Can, can you imagine, right? You're at the table with a bunch of people and you just pull up the tablecloth and start shining your teeth, right? Uh, nor with a napkin, nor with a fork or a knife. Get that old knife out, get things clean. Um, but if others do it, let it be done with a pick tooth, which of course we know today is a toothpick, right? Now, for Washington, he begins to see that there is an awareness that what we do impacts us who are observing us, that other people see us. And this becomes a big thing to Washington. His public image is what we would call it today. But for him, it's his public self. He knows people are watching him. And somewhere in the back of his mind, he's thinking, what image am I portraying to people? Am I portraying a lead, uh, uh, an image of a great leader? Or somebody who's cleaning my teeth, right, with a tablecloth. And so we watch Washington as he grows into adulthood, begin to think about these kinds of things. What I do matters because people are watching me. And then a third one is let your countenance be pleasant 
but in a serious matter, somewhat grave. So I want to stop right there for a moment. This description really fits George Washington. Those who meet George Washington say one of two things about him. They say when they hang out with George, he's this upbeat person. He's, have you ever been around that kind of personality that when you're around them, they just have that bearing, that, that magnetism? That's George Washington. But when it was time to do something serious, and there was something to be accomplished, people said his, his face would change, and he was like, this is business time. We're not going to do fun and games. We're going to get this done, right? And you see this right here, right? But in serious matters, somewhat grave. And then it says, undertake not what you cannot perform, but be careful to keep your promise. This becomes a, a really big thing to George Washington. Um, this idea of as simple as keep your word. It's interesting when George Washington is offered the opportunity to lead the Continental Forces, <laughs> He kind of sends mixed messages because he tells everybody that, that will listen to him that they shouldn't pick me. I'm not qualified. I've only led small groups of men and now they're going to put me in charge of all these people, right? But when they're picking who's going to lead the Continental Army, he shows up in his uniform and he non-verbally sends a message, pick me, <laughs> right? So I, I'm thinking somewhere in the, in the back of his head, he's... He's thinking about this, right? If I'm gonna do this, I have to keep my word. I have to follow through. And the fact is, guys, he will follow through. When he becomes the commander of the American forces, he will lead them for eight long years. And when others say, let's give up, Washington refuses to give up over and over. And so he fulfills both of these, right? He's hesitant, but once he's given the task, He's unstoppable. He's not going to quit. I, I, I just want to remind everybody that what you read, what you hear, and what you watch matters. You absorb it. And I think that's really important when we're, we're, we're teaching kids. What are they absorbing? What are you surrounding them with? I always tell people, I think it's really important for children that you, you have lots of books in a room. So they see books are valuable. You play music, so they see music is valuable. They see you pray, so they know that you're communing with God, that you believe that's important to you. What do they see and absorb? For George Washington, these 110 had a big impact on him. He absorbed them, and they became part of his character. Washington also was into Stoics. Uh, Stoicism basically is this idea uh, that they preach the necessity of a virtuous life, free of corruption and immorality. And in particular, right, um, the love of money. So we said, man, this will destroy you. Money will destroy you. And of course, the Apostle Paul famously communicated it's the root of all evil. And so what's interesting is when George Washington takes command of the revolutionary forces, they want to pay him. And he says, no, don't pay me anything. Now, they do pay for his expenses, like for his horse and things like that. They said, I don't want any money. I don't know how many of you would work for somebody for eight years without any money, but that's what George Washington does. And just to put that in perspective, I, I don't know what that would be in modern money, but he lost about $5,000 a year is what one historian has estimated. Another historian said that after eight years is done, he loses half of all his income. That's a sacrifice, right? And so somewhere this teaching, both the biblical and then the Stoics are shaping this young George Washington, right? I'm not gonna be controlled by money. I'm gonna do things because it's the right thing to do. Basically he pays a heavy penalty. I think it's, it's really interesting. There are a number of historians that, especially in the 1970s, they were really into, all the founders were fighting the revolution so they could put a little money in their wallets. And I'm like, I don't know what you guys are talking about. Because I know what happened to George Washington. I know what happened to the men who signed the Declaration of Independence. Most of them went bankrupt. But uh, anyway, just so you know, there are people who, who say things, and then there's the reality of what actually happened. Another thing that plays a key role is a play by Cato that's written by Joseph Addison. And this really influences George Washington. He goes to this play multiple times. Uh, he's even gonna have soldiers at Valley Forge perform this play. He's so into Cato. How, how many of you guys have been to a play in the last year? 
Kind of interesting, isn't it? I, I, I guess today our play is TV, I don't know. But this was a big deal, right? This Cato, so who was Cato? Cato is basically a young Republican senator in ancient Rome, and he's one of the guys that's gonna try to get rid of Caesar. It's not gonna end well for Cato. Now, George Washington wants to create what's called a republic, where the people have the power. And so he obsesses over the Romans and the idea of we will not have an emperor. The people will have the power. And so Cato is, is kind of that imagery, right, of this. And there's a famous quote uh, in, in, in Cato, and it goes like this. How beautiful is death when earned by virtue? Who would not be that youth? What pity is it that we can die but wants to serve our country? Now, what's interesting is, right, he's got soldiers performing this. He must be reading it all the time. <laughs> I mean, like psycho kind of with this play. There's a young man by the name of Nathan Hale. He's a school teacher, and he's given up teaching to join the revolutionary cause. The picture we have is George Washington is about to take on the greatest army in the world, the British, the largest amphibious assault in history up to that point. He's outnumbered, and he has a really kind of weak army compared to the best army in the world. And he's also lacking intelligence, meaning he doesn't know what the British are up to. So he says, I need a volunteer to be a spy. And this young Nathan Hale, just a kid, you know, because most teachers at this time were just kids, right? They'd get out of school and, I mean, by the age of 18, they're ready to teach. A little different than today, right? So at the age of 18, this, you know, this, this young kid, Nathan Hale, he goes, I'll do it, I'll be your spy. And they're like, well, how, how do, what are you gonna pretend to be? And he goes, I'll just be a school teacher. So he goes into New York, right? And he wanders around New York gathering intelligence. And when the British stop him, say, who are you? So I'm just a school teacher uh, passing through and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't believe him. Because most people are fleeing for their lives at this point. They know a big war is coming. So finally they arrest him. And after some interrogation and calling in witnesses, they're like, you're a spy. And you know what we do to spies? We hang spies. Now, if he had been a soldier caught in a uniform, you shoot soldiers, you hang spies. Because that's supposed to be more disgraceful, right? So they put him up on the ladder. They're going to pull the ladder out. And he says, gentlemen, you're men of honor. I'm a man of honor. At least let me say a few words. And they say, okay, go ahead. <laughs> I'm trying to picture this kid about to be hung, right? Before they hang him, here's what he says. And I want you to remember what I, I read to you from the play Cato. Here's what he says. I regret that I have but one life to give for my country. Basically, he just plagiarized it right from Cato because clearly he had been exposed to it just like Washington and probably with Washington. But it shapes who he is, just like it shapes who Washington is. So my question to you is, what is it that you're reading? What is it that your children are reading what are they watching that's shaping their values? Spider-Man, has anybody watched the movie Spider-Man, right? He famously says, and I bring this up because my students bring this up all the time, right? With great power comes great responsibility. How many have heard that famous Spider-Man quote, right? Mm -hmm. What a great teaching moment. You're right. Let's talk about that. What does that look like? This great teaching moment for Washington. He's not much of a reader. He'll read a few books, right, on agriculture and the military, but not a lot of plays. Do we have people like that maybe that don't read as much, but there's something that grabs them. For me, um, it's, it's the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. Very formative in my life. The idea that one man, unnoticed, can make a difference. And I really think what a, a tremendous call for everybody, right? One man or one woman can make a difference even if no one notices. They still matter. So Washington is shaped um, by this important play uh, called Cato. One of the things that's really formative is at the age of 11, his dad dies. Now, when you lose your dad in colonial America, that's not a good thing because he's kind of the guy that's in charge of your education, in charge of your future. And now he doesn't have that uh, father to guide him and to lead him. His dad helped him a little bit, um, but... He's not exposed to the classics. 
He's not exposed to foreign languages, all these things that all these other founding fathers are going to be exposed to. And remember, he doesn't learn a foreign language. That's going to turn out to be pretty important in a little bit when we'll talk about why. He doesn't know any foreign languages. He does know trigonometry. Reading about this man and over and over, and it comes across, but he knew trigonometry. And I'm like, for a kid that's poorly educated, wouldn't we like to have a few kids who could learn trigonometry today, <clears throat> right? So George Washington, um, he knows trigonometry, but because he doesn't have his father, he is going to need mentors. And there are a series of people that were mentored. The first of these is his half-brother by the name of Lawrence. And Lawrence is kind of working with the British Army as a colonial. He goes to, to South America and he serves and so forth. And Washington actually gets to travel with him into the Caribbean and so forth. Um, but he looks up to his, his older half-brother. He kind of takes that place of his father. And he goes, I want to be a soldier just like my brother. And it becomes his ambition, right? And so in this case, we see that he inspires uh, his little brother, George, to a military career. Another man is a guy by the name of George Fairfax. He's like the Lord of Virginia, right? Kind of thing. We're, we're not supposed to have lords in America, but that's really what he is. He's like the upper crust. And George gets to start going because of his, his older brother. He gets to go over there to their house. And when he goes over there, he, come, he comes from a... They don't have a lot of money because dad's not there. And he goes over into this mansion and they have balls. And he lets George come in and learn how to dance and how to, how to do things like bow properly. And he just watches Fairfax. You see, a mentor sometimes, what you do is you just illustrate by what you do. And I got to ask you, how many of you have somebody that's watching you? And you, you don't even think about it, but they're watching who you are and what you're doing. That was Lord Fairfax. Then there was Governor Dinwiddie. And Governor Dinwiddie becomes his patron. He opens the door for Washington to get into to the military and to, and to a military career. Who are you opening the door for? Right? Who's in your life that needs a door opened? And you're the person to make that possible. Mm -hmm. And then there's General Braddock, who will serve under, we'll be talking about a little later. He's the one that gives Washington a real vision of what the military is, not just kind of the grandiose picture he has as a kid, but here's what it really looks like. Here's what you need to do to actually be a soldier. So mentoring sometimes is you get in and you actually teach somebody the hard day-to-day -day stuff of life, right? Because big visions are great, but if nobody teaches you how to accomplish those big <laughs> visions, then that's all they remain, right? Our big visions. And I, I'm going to throw in one other person that mentors him. And this doesn't seem like somebody you would say is a mentor, but it's his wife, Martha. Um, Martha, not only is she going to basically financially bankroll him, she's going to help him become the George Washington we would know with a mansion and all that stuff. But she's his companion. And year after year during the Revolutionary War, when he gets a little depressed, a little down, his wife travels across the country to stay with him every winter. And she encourages him and speaks life to him. And she throws uh, banquets and different things as much sometimes they don't have a lot of food, but the best they can for the other officers. But I don't want you to just think she's just providing those things. She's also providing wisdom to him. And I want to give you one quote from Martha Washington. I think it's one of the most profound things uh, any of our founders whether male or female, had to say. And here's what she said. I'm still determined to be cheerful and to be happy in whatever situation I may be, for I have learned from experience that the greatest part of our happiness or misery depends upon our dispositions, not upon our circumstances. We carry the seeds of one or the other about with us in our minds wherever we go. In other words, guys, we have a choice on whether we're going to be happy or whether we're going to be miserable. And you have both seeds in you. And every day you have to choose which seed you're going to nurture. Can you imagine you're George Washington and you're struggling with, I don't have enough food to feed my men. I don't have enough bullets. I, I, people aren't following me like they're supposed to follow me. And then Martha comes in and basically gives a, a little bit of wisdom like that. And so sometimes a mentor is somebody who will come in and when you are, you're struggling, 
They kind of grab hold of you and say, you can do this, but it's going to be a choice. You're going to have to make the choice. And so I think in that way, she played a key role. So I want to look at how did George Washington rise above, right? And we're, we're looking at how did he rise above not having this formal education. We've already identified he had mentors. Uh, he also has kind of an apprenticeship or an internship, if you will, during the French and Indian War. One historian said that basically it was the school for the American Revolution. He learned all kinds of stuff about combat then. And here's what I, uh, one of the number one pieces of advice I give to young people is when you go to college, get an internship, go do something where you actually gain experience. Because what, what do kids always hear when they get out of college? Well, you don't have any experience. I like your resume. You just don't know anything, <laughs> right? You don't know anything practical. So get, go get an internship. And in essence, that's what George Washington does. He gets an internship through the, the, through the French and Indian War that prepares him for the Revolutionary War. So maybe he's not getting a formal education, but he's out doing. And I want you to remember that. He's out doing. He's doing stuff. He's learning with the hard knocks of life. And that's going to prepare him uh, as we go forward. Next, here's kind of an antiquated word, practice. Timothy Pickering, who's his Secretary of War, recalled that when he first began to look at George Washington's uh, writing, his letters, he goes, oh my gosh, this guy's President of the United States. Look at his spelling. Look at what he's writing. Oh, right? But then Pickering notes that Washington began to improve and he got better and better. And he, he noticed that how Washington did it was he looked at other examples of good letters, especially Alexander Hamilton, who was a tremendous writer. He began to model his letters after Alexander Hamilton. And then he would take a lot of care and rewrite letters over and over until he got them so they were just right. So they looked like those good models of letters. Ironically, Washington becomes one of the greatest uh, writers in American history. He's gonna write thousands, I mean thousands of letters. And so uh, before I move on with that, talking about, I mean, here he is this prolific correspondent. It was through practice. How many times do we have people who say, I can't do that, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna quit, as opposed to somebody in their life says, how about you work at it, and then practice, and practice again. That's George Washington. That's the model that he's following as a leader. Um, and I also wanna point out, he also keeps a daily journal, which I think is great, right? That you're recording what you do, so that you can look back and say, here's where I made mistakes, and here's where I can improve based on the past, right? And I, I have to tell you, one of my, my nerdiest moments is I was, I was getting some master's credit at Brown University, and they had George Washington's journal, and they brought it out. I was sitting in this special room or something with his artifacts, and I was in full nerddom, and they brought the journal over to me, and, I, I, and they said, would you like to hold it? <laughs> yeah, you mean, is it, it, it is a journal? And I said, yeah. I go, well, okay. give me some gloves, because I had been a ranger, and we always, we were like, you gotta wear gloves for everything, right? I said, you don't need gloves. Said, what are you talking about? This is George Washington's journal. And he says, it's made of linen, and your oil on your hands is actually good for his journal. So here I am, barehanded, and I said, would you guys mind, I know we're in this like room, but there's a bunch of teachers out there, and I'd kind of like to stroll out with George Washington. <laughs> Would you mind if I do that? And they looked at me like, okay, weirdo. <laughs> yes, you may do that. So I stroll out with George Washington's journal, <laughs> and I'm like, hey, you guys want to see what George was doing on day? You know, so anyway, sorry to, to have that little nerd aside there. Um, but. Daily journaling makes, is a great practice as well. Here's another thing Washington did. He would listen to counsel. Washington was an attack kind of guy as a general. And early in the war, he's like, let's just go attack him, let's go attack him. But he would stop and he had the wisdom to call in all his officers and he would say, I'd like everybody to write down what you think we should do. And then he would review what everyone had suggested 
And then he'd go, no one else wants to attack. And after a while, he began to recognize the wisdom that came from bringing in all the generals, making them do work and think through the process, and then he would review it and make his decision. And eventually, he becomes known as the Fabian of the American Revolution. During the time of Rome, there's this guy by the name of Hannibal who comes, maybe you heard of him, with elephants coming over the mountains, over the Alps. They come down, and he, he wipes out the Romans at the Battle of Cannae, kills 70,000 of these Romans who are strutting around. Now they're not strutting, they're dead, right? <laughs> and they're like, what are we going to do? And Fabian, who becomes known as the delayer, says, here's what we're going to do. I'm not going to ever attack him head on. I'm just going to attack and run, attack and run. Washington, who's familiar with the Romans, right, as we talked about, he starts listening to his advisors, and then he goes, <clears throat> I can be Fabian. We can't take on the British head on. We're not ready to do that, but I can attack and run. I can attack and run. And so in humility, he listens to these other generals. Some of them, I'm going to be honest, were qualified to be listened to. But he had the humility to listen, to counsel. And so uh, to communicate that to people, who do you gather around and have them say, here's what I'm going to do. What do you think? And you ask four or five different people. Submit, here are good outcomes, bad outcomes. Submit them to me so I can make a plan. <clears throat> When's the last time you've done that? That's a really critical thing to learn, right? So he may not be book smart, but he's smart enough to listen to others. Now, fast forward, he's going to be president of the United States, first president. He doesn't have anybody to advise him. So he takes the heads of different departments and he says, oh, you guys come in here. Okay. And he does the same thing. He begins to ask them questions. And he creates what today we know as the cabinet. Mm -hmm. It's not in the Constitution. He just knows I need to listen to other people and get their advice. And he doesn't just call on anybody, right? He calls in the big guns, Thomas Jefferson, <clears throat> Alexander Hamilton, right? Men that are clearly smarter than he is. Now as a leader, you have to have the humility to call in people who know more than you do. That's tough, but Washington does it really. His whole life, he does it. And he calls them in and he gets that advice from them. Um, and so they help, help him a lot. I want to identify that he recognizes that not all smarts are book smarts. Now that's a hard thing for a teacher to say, but there are people who are very talented outside of school, right? Now we've all seen that like with an athlete who compensates or maybe not being great in the classroom or a musician, right? In band or, or whatever, they find that place. Washington, was an incredible horseman. Many consider that he was the greatest horseman uh, of the era, period. And when he'd get on his great white mount, I mean, he's already a big dude, like 6'3", where the average height is like 5'6", five, 5'7". Five, so when he walked into a room, you knew Washington was walking into a room, but when he's on his white steed, he's like one with his horse. Just one quick story. At the Battle of Trenton, right? This is the, the famous thing where we're almost over, we're almost defeated, we're crushed, and Washington gives the famous passcode, victory or death, right? And they're gonna launch a surprise attack on the Hessians who are our German allies of the British. And it's snowing and it's icy and they cross, right? The frozen Delaware and they get to the other side and the roads are just covered in ice. Now you've all been on an icy road in a car before, right? Have you ever been on an icy road on a horse? He's riding his horse and he's like, he's, you know, studly George Washington riding along. And all of a sudden, the horse's legs start going out in four different directions. That could be pretty embarrassing, right? If you're leading the men into battle, you know, it goes like that. Here's what Washington does. You tell me if you would follow this guy into battle. He takes the mane of the horse, he grabs the mane of the horse, and he pulls it up with one arm. He pulls the horse up like you would a puppet or something. And he pulls it straight up. And all the guys gather around are like, whoa, right? Who is this guy? Sometimes it's not book smarts. There's some other gifting maybe God has given you that you have 
that's unique. Maybe you have a skill to fix things or paint things or, or whatever. Don't undersell those. Just one other final thought on that. I've had kids who could barely get a C in my class that are millionaires now. Let me repeat that. I had kids who could not get a barely, or get a C in my class, but barely had to work at it. And now they're millionaires. And every now and then I'll get together with them. And I say, will you buy my coffee? I did give you a C, right? I mean, so I just want you to understand there are all types of different strengths and Washington's tapping into all these other strengths. And then he becomes a man of action. The fact is guys, his motto is deeds and not words. Deeds and not words. What an awesome motto. Please understand, this is a time when you have people like Jefferson, Madison, Hamilton, who can write the most beautiful things. Washington could never dream of writing. And then you have people like John Adams and Patrick Henry, who they have these powerful voices, right? That just woo people over. And that's not George Washington either. Not a great speaker, not a great writer, but he is a great doer. He's the guy that will act upon what they wrote. He's the guy that will act upon what they said. He is the doer, right? The man of deeds. And so, hey, maybe I don't have this great education, but I get things done. And so this is George Washington getting things done. And I, I gotta tell you, um, one of his heroes uh, was a guy by the name of Cincinnati. Maybe you've heard of Cincinnati, Ohio. Mm -hmm. Cincinnati was this Roman farmer, back to the Romans, because he loved the Romans. Mm -hmm. And apparently these barbarians were invading, right? And they needed somebody to lead them. So they called Cincinnati in and they said, hey, we're going to give you the power of a dictator. You put an army together and go defeat them. And Cincinnati does that. And as soon as he defeats them, all the guys that appointed him, they're all like, oh my gosh, we made him dictator. <laughs> He's going to stay dictator. <laughs> So Sinatis comes back and he goes, here's your sword. Where's my plow? And he goes back to the farm. And all the Romans are like, who is this guy, right? Washington reads all about Cincinnati. So when he is the commanding general of the American forces and the Revolutionary War is over, everybody thinks he's going to become a dictator. Matter of fact, there's a number of people that ask him to become a dictator. And he says no. And what's shocking is George III, who we're fighting against, the King of England, he says, if George Washington actually gives up his power, even I will believe he's a great man. He gives up his power. What's wild is he gives up his power a second time when he becomes President of the United States. <laughs> you know what's funny? I, I just marvel at this because in, in the history of the world, we're used to Caesars. We're used to people, once they get power, they take it the Cromwells, the Caesars, who they never give back their power. He gives it back twice. And today there are historians who no longer rank George Washington as number one. <laughs> Seriously, the guy who gave up being king twice, he can't, he can't be number one, but just saying. So, so pretty wild stuff here, right? Now it's all amazing, right? He overcomes these deficiencies. Washington is gonna find a way to go around over and sometimes through his educational problems. And today, does anyone talk about George Washington's educational failures? Is that like the talking point we have? No, no one remembers that. What they remember is he's a man of leadership, a man of character, a man of wisdom and courage and perseverance. I, I love this. There was a historian I met years ago. His name was Peter Henrique. And he said this, I'll never forget this. He said, Jefferson, Madison, Hamilton, Franklin, and Adams were all smarter than Washington. And yet they all looked to him for leadership. Isn't that wild? Every one of them looked to him for leadership. All right, the second thing we want to look at is overcoming failure. And this is the second major area of Washington's life I want to examine. So what's going on is we have something called the French and Indian War. Uh, and the French and Indian War is also known as the Seven Years' War. And many historians consider it to be our first world war. You know that one in the 20th century? No. This is probably our first world war. I mean, they're fighting all over the world. They're fighting in the uh, Philippines, they're fighting in India, and of course they're fighting here in North America. And that's what we're gonna focus on. 
Now, please understand, during this time period, we have two superpowers vying for North America. We have the French and we have the English. And they, in particular, want a place called the Ohio River Valley. Canada's fine, it's cold. But the Ohio River Valley, they can both envision. The English colonists are heading that way and they're like, good farmland. The French and the Indians are out there, great fur trapping, lots of money to be made. And at this time, if you wanted to travel out there, the number one way to travel is by river. Not a lot of roads at this time in history. Whoever controls the rivers can control an entire area. And there's one place where there's a confluence of rivers, where they come together, the Ohio, the Allegheny, and the Monongahela. And the French and the English realize whoever builds the first fort there is basically gonna control the Ohio River Valley. <laughs> And the French build the first fort, Fort Duquesne. Later, the British are gonna win this war and they'll build Fort Pitt, which becomes Pittsburgh, right? So, but we're, we're not there at the end. We're at the beginning, right? And Fort Duquesne is built and the French have control of it. And the governor of Virginia, his name is Governor Dinwiddie. Would you like to be stuck with that one? That's right, Governor Dinwiddie. <laughs> And he calls in young George Washington and he goes, I have a mission for you, kid. Now, why is he picking George Washington? Remember those mentors? Like Fairfax and so forth. He's got connections. And so then what he says, I'm, I, I'm gonna send you, I want you to go to this Fort Duquesne and I want you to tell the French, get out. This is English territory. So imagine this punky little kid, early 20s, going like, I'm important, right? And he rides out to Fort Duquesne and he goes in and he tells the French commander, uh, this is English territory, you should leave. And the French commanders, I don't wanna say hats George on the head, but that's kind of his response. Oh, that's so cute. Then what he set you to tell me uh, to do that? Oh, okay. He doesn't say okay, he says, no. You can eat and then you may leave. This is French territory. And so he goes on his mission, he comes back from his mission, and before we move on, I wanna tell this little aside. It's shocking that Washington is the man that's selected for this mission. If it had been up to his mother, Mary, this would have never happened. You see, Mary, his mom was very protective. She didn't want him to go anywhere. And he has dreams of being like his, his brother Lawrence, this famous military guy, right? And his mom's like, no. So what happened that his mom became so protective? Well, some historians believe it goes back to when Mary was pregnant with George, right? And she's full with George right here. And it's church. And they've come from church and they're all going to Washington's, uh, to his plantation, to his father's plantation. And they're going to have a luncheon with other church people. You've probably all done that after church, right? Let's all get together and eat together. So they're in this cabin, basically, and they're sitting at this long table, and the storm comes along. And it's not just any storm. It's one of those lightning storms where everything shakes, right? And they're all sitting at, like, if you can imagine, like a big wooden picnic table inside the cabin. Several families seated there. Fireplace over here. And all of a sudden, a lightning bolt strikes the fireplace mm -hmm. travels down the fireplace, comes out of the fireplace and it comes towards the picnic table and sitting at the end is a little girl, one of the neighbor girls. She has her fork, mm -hmm. excuse me, her fork, well, she was left-handed, and her knife. And she's ready to eat and the lightning strikes her and the two pieces of metal come together and fuse together in her hands and she dies instantaneously. Now Mary, with George, is sitting just a little further down, and that jolt goes on and it reaches her, but by then, it's not dangerous, but she fills it, and she looks at a whore as she watches this child die right in front of her. And somewhere in her mind, she vows, I'm never gonna let this child out of my sight. Thank you. Harm is not gonna come to my little baby. Right? And so she becomes very protective. And I believe she is the hand, as George Washington says, when he refers to God, the hand of providence. Mm -hmm. 
because George wants to be in the military and mama keeps saying no. And so he works out a scheme with his brother Lawrence, remember one of his, his older brother, they get a little scheme. He goes, look, I know there's a ship in the harbor. We can get you down on that ship, right? And you can join the British Navy. <clears throat> Somebody on that ship knows Mary and comes and tells Mary, your boy's heading down there to join the British Navy. And Mary's like, uh, over my dead body. And so she's storming down there and, you know, I don't want to say grabbing them by the ears, but you're not going to be in the British Navy, right? <laughs> now imagine George Washington, American hero, could have just been a midshipman in the British Navy. Okay. But because of his mom being protective, and most historians say overly protective, the course of his life is set in a different pattern. So here's what I want you to hear. How many times is there someone in your life that you resent being in your life? You resent the direction they send you, but they're being a, 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 an emissary of providence of God, just like Mary was for George. So back to our story, right? George has gone out. He's told people at Fort Duquesne, get out of there. And they said no. So he goes back to Dinwiddie and he says, uh, they laughed at me basically. What should we do? And he goes, nobody laughs at, you know, the British. And so Dinwiddie is going to send George Washington back uh, with some uh, Virginian colonials and some British soldiers. And this time they're just going to go take the fort. And, and this is when the wild stuff begins to happen. As they're traveling along, they're going to come up on these rocks and they'll look down into the rocks and there's a glen down there below. And what does he see but a bunch of French soldiers and Indians? He's like, oh my gosh, they're coming to attack us. Now, George Washington is 22, and he's thinking, this is my moment of glory. I'm going to ambush the French. So they're up on these rocks, and I actually walked down here, was standing down here, so it's, it's, quite, it's, a, it's a ways down, but I can see there's nowhere to run. You're kind of trapped right here. And so when I give the word, we're going to fire down on them, right? Now, Washington has British with him, and he has some Indian allies with him. And they fire down on the French. They kill a few Frenchmen, and the French are like, okay, we surrender, right? And Washington's like, wow, this is too easy. So they climb, they, they kind of climb down. There's a little rocky area you can climb down here. And they, you know, they're telling the British to throw down their guns. And the commander or the leader of this uh, force is a guy by the name of Jumonville. That's, this is going to be named Jumonville Glen eventually. He is the brother of the commander of the French fort. In all likelihood, he is on a mission to Virginia, just like what George Washington had done. He's an ambassador for the French, but George doesn't know that. It's okay, he hasn't killed Jumonville. But one of the Indian allies, his name is Half Moon. He didn't come to have Frenchmen surrender. He came for blood. And so while Washington is telling all the Frenchmen, put your guns down, uh, we're British, we'll treat you well. Half Moon runs up to Jamonville with his hatchet and he buries it in his head, in Jamonville's head. It just splits his head open. Wow. Now, Washington, who's 22, he's just gone from everybody's going to say I'm the greatest to, oh my gosh, what has just happened? The French surrendered to me and now my Indian allies are starting to massacre them. And he's like, stop, don't, don't do this, right? And the Indians are like, we're not listening to this punky little 22 year old kid. <laughs> Finally, he gets them to stop, but the damage is done. In particular, one of the Frenchmen in all the hollow blue is able to escape and run back to Fort Duquesne. Mm. Washington realizes one of the French have escaped. When that Frenchman gets back to Fort Duquesne, he tells Monville's older brother, guess what happened? You know how you sent them out as emissaries? Well, they murdered your brother. He surrendered and they just split his head open. George Washington's responsible. You mean that punky kid that came here earlier? Let's get him. So they put together this force of French and Indians and they start chasing Washington. And Washington realizes they're coming for him and he knows he can't outrun him. So he decides we better stop and build a fort. And he's gonna pick kind of this grassy meadow down in the valley. Now, can I tell you, children know in a snowball fight, you take the high ground. <laughs> George Washington picks a meadow down in the valley. Why? I'll give him this credit. He has to feed his horses, mm -hmm. and that's important. And there's lots of grass and meadows. Mm -hmm. But being in meadow, 
is not a good place because when the French and Indians come, I don't know how well you can see, but they're going to get in the woods, and this is kind of sloped up. And the only fort, when we, this is going to be named Fort Necessity. The name says it, kind of everything you need to know, right? Fort Necessity. It's basically a bunch of palisades or sticks coming out of the ground. And then, I don't know if you can see this, but they, they put this little trench around. And I've been there, I took this picture. The trench is like this, this tall. Well, that's gonna be helpful, right? So when the Indians and French come, they're in the woods and he's in there and he's like, bring it on. We got our fort, we've got our trench. And the French and Indians open fire and they're firing down at the British and the colonials. And as if that were not bad enough, it starts to rain. And I don't know where rain goes. Maybe it's in a meadow. Oh yes, it's in a meadow. And it begins to flood. In 18th century warfare, one of the most important things is to keep your powder dry. So now he's surrounded by the French and Indians and he can't fire back, but they're under trees which provide cover so they can fire down and their powder is dry. And soon he's got his guys lying on their bellies behind this wall and it's filling up with water and soon it's filling up with blood. And your young George Washington can't see there. There's, they built like this little little hut thing inside. And he goes in with his other commanders and like, what do you think we should do? They're all like, oh, we've got to surrender. We're dying. Now, I can imagine George Washington is thinking about Jumonville, mm -hmm. right? They surrendered, that didn't go so well. Mm -hmm. But he has no choice. So they parley, they call for the French, the white flag, come in. He's supposed to have an interpreter a French interpreter, but his interpreter doesn't really know French that well. And they give Washington this document, say, if you sign this document, we'll let you and your army leave. We won't harm you. You can go back uh, to Virginia. We won't touch you. Washington's like, well, that's a pretty good deal. Well, it's not, because he's actually signing a confession that he murdered, ambushed and murdered Jumonville. He doesn't have a clue, right? So when he gets back to Williamsburg, he's like high-fiving everybody. Yeah, okay, things, we had a little rough time, but things turned out okay. Shortly after that, the French send a little note. Um, your commander murdered one of our commanders. That means it's war. So I, I want you to hear this. The First World War and world history, right? And it's First World War. It started by George Washington on accident. Now, can we agree that's not a great start? <laughs> what do you do when you were young? I started a world war. That's hard to dig out of, right? But George Washington is going to dig out of it. I mean, we know he's going to go on to become quite a great man. I want to talk about this idea of being a, hit, a, a, a hero. There are all kinds of definitions of what a hero is, and I came up with my own definition. Heroes are imperfect people who rise above their imperfections to do great things. You see, there are no perfect heroes. There are a lot of men and women who fail a lot, and they keep making a choice to rise above their failures. That's what makes a hero, and that's George Washington. So Washington, uh, He's not going to give up. Uh, he's not going to quit. Basically, he is going to go um, after Fort Necessity. He's going to go with Braddock to try to capture Fort Necessity. And as they're traveling, he tells Braddock, you know what? This isn't like fighting in Europe. The Indians and the French don't fight like normal people fight. And Braddock basically tells this 22-year-old kid, what do you know? You don't know anything about battle. I'm just bringing you along, kid, to make the Virginians happy, right? And you know the territory. And Washington falls back. He has dysentery at this point. That's he's been drinking bad water, which means he's going to the bathroom all the time. And so bad, he's put pillows on his horse, which has got to be a little embarrassing. And he falls back, and then he thinks, I can't miss the action. So here he is, sore backside, dysentery. He rides hard to catch up with Braddock and he catches up just in time for Braddock to be ambushed by the French and the Indians. And Braddock's like trying to tell his men, okay, go here and go there. And these British soldiers don't know how to fight people who are hiding in the woods. 
and they begin to die left and right. Braddock is hit. The British officers are hit. And pretty soon there's no one in charge. And so Washington, he just takes charge. And what's wild is he's going to have bullets go flying through his coat, a bullet through his hat. He'll have two horses shot out from under him. And he keeps getting back up and leading the men. He has Braddock placed um, in a cart. And this is the famous scene of Braddock has been wounded. I took this picture because this is what that scene looks like today. There's a high rise right there. This is a, this is a picture in the wilderness uh, about 10 miles from there where they would have traveled, okay? As a matter of fact, when Braddock dies, it basically, Washington has him put in the ground and then all the wagons go over him so that the Indians can't find him to kind of dig him up and do bad things to him, right? So Washington takes command. Everybody's shooting at him. He's the last guy and he is going to lead them in retreat. And so he goes from failure to success. And ironically, his success is leading a retreat. But all of a sudden people go, wow, this guy, he's something more than a 22 year old kid. He's a man and he took charge and was courageous. And they begin to see this in him, right? Um, and so this is, this is super important. He becomes an international hero because of this. But the fact is there are gonna be more ups and downs to come. So for instance, after this campaign, Dinwiddie puts him in charge of being on the frontier and protecting the Virginians from Indian attacks. And he does a really good job. He, go, he rides everywhere. He has forts put everywhere. He does all this stuff. But can I tell you something? The Indians still get through and kill people. So is George Washington a failure? Or was he successful because he saved a lot of lives? After this, he becomes the commander of the Revolutionary War, right? And he has this epic fight called the New York Campaign. I mentioned it earlier, like 30 some thousand British soldiers are landed. He has 19,000, right? It is a complete disaster. The British fool him. He's in full retreat. And when they're done, he's gonna go from 19,000 soldiers down to about 2,000 soldiers. Mm -hmm. And it basically looks like the war is over. And that's the moment in which he launches his surprise attack on Trenton and saves the Revolutionary War. That's why he says victory or death, because he said, we either win or we're all going to die. And people don't think about this, but you do understand George Washington was a traitor. Mm -hmm. And do you know what happens to traitors? Have you ever heard of drawing and quartering? Has anyone ever seen the movie Braveheart? I had to close my eyes through part of that because they're drawing and quartering. That's where what they do is first they... Yeah, do you, you want to hear this? I, okay, I, I will spare the drawing part. They take your intestines out um, <laughs> while you're alive. And then they tie you uh, to four horses, one on each limb, and they send the horses to the four different directions, the four corners of the empire. So everyone knows this is what happens to traitors. I, I gotta tell you guys, Washington's aware of that, right? So when he says victory or death, he, he knows what he's talking about, right? And they launch this surprise attack at Trenton and it's successful. Uh, but then after that, things don't go well. There's all kinds of guys who want to replace Washington, and there's all kinds of attempts to replace him with other commanders who think they're better. But somehow Washington survives that. And then things get really bad towards the end of the war. He can't pay his troops. Congress isn't giving him any money. And they get really angry. And they begin to call for a mutiny. And somebody sends out this thing called the Newburgh Letter. And it's to all the officers. And it basically says, you know what? You're tired of not being paid, aren't you? You fought for this country and they haven't paid you a dime. Let's say maybe we march and, uh, 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 on the Capitol here and we take control. Washington sees this letter and Washington says, I don't want anything to do with this. That disgusts me. We're going to be a republic. The officers don't care at this point. They're so angry they're not being paid. They call for a meeting. And they gather, and so Washington knows they're gathering, and so he decides he better show up. So I want you to picture, here's George Washington. He's been leading these men for eight years now. And now they're talking mutiny, and they didn't even invite Washington this time because they knew he was against it, but he shows up. And so picture all the people out there, these, these battle-hardened veterans, right? And they're all kind of grumbling. 
and Washington shows up in Norm Lanky. There's Washington. This time it's like, what's he want? And Washington, who's not a passionate speaker, gets up in front of these men and he says, look guys, we have fought together. We've shed blood together. We're patriots together. You can't do this. We had a dream to be a republic. And some of them are even, you know, have you ever had that where you're talking and then people start leaning over the other person like, what a jerk, right? And he can read the audience. So in desperation, he reaches in, he, 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 he reaches in, he pulls out a letter. And it's a letter talking about this, this guy who's saying Congress is going to try to pay the soldiers better. And he starts to read it, right? And as he's reading it, his hand's shaking like this. And he looks out and he can tell everybody's bored. Nobody's listening. So he stops and he realizes that he can't really read the letter. And so he reaches into his coat again and he pulls out his spectacles. And he says, I, I, I'm sorry, guys. My eyes have grown dim in service of my country. And he puts his glasses on and he starts to read. And the weirdest thing happens. I don't know what to call it other than divine providence, the hand of God. These battle-hardened, angry guys start to weep. They're ashamed. You see, George Washington in his service has grown old. And he's gone from a young man who could see to a man who has to wear these now. And they're all like, oh my gosh, this guy has sacrificed for eight years and now we're going to betray everything he stood for. And one by one, they get up and they leave. And we don't have a coup because of a pair of glasses. And a leader who just faithfully did what he had to do, right? Mm -hmm. He has other failures he has to overcome as well. Like this guy, Benedict Arnold. Most people don't realize had Benedict Arnold not become a traitor, we would probably have a state today named after Benedict Arnold. We would probably have 50 cities named after this man. He was unbelievable. He was the, the Hannibal of the revolution, right? Uh, he leads an attack up into Canada to try to capture Canada through the wilderness. And it's so tough, they're reduced to eating candle wax and moccasins. And, and he gets them there anyway, right? Uh, when the British tried to invade from the north, they were going to come down Lake Champlain. And they've actually disassembled British battleships and put them on this lake. He has nothing. He goes and he puts together a bunch of little tugboat things, right? River boats. And they stop the British. Not done. The Indians are coming down and they're joining the British uh, leader, St. Leaguer, through New York. They're going to try to divide the colonies. And there's nobody there to stop them. And so you know what he does? He knows the Indians believe that madmen are prophetic. So he leaves where he's at. He, run, he runs across the wilderness. He arrives and he comes to the Indian camp. And he ruffles his hair. And he starts grooming. And he comes into the Indian camp and he comes, hey, hey, everybody, right? I've got some bad news for you. The Americans have a big army and it's coming your way and they're going to kill you. <laughs> and he just does all kinds of crazy stuff and they go, oh my gosh, he's a crazy man. That must be true. And so all the Indian allies of the British leave. <coughs> and without the Indian allies, the British can't win. And as if that's not enough, then at the most important battle, the Battle of Saratoga, the turning point of the war, Benedict Arnold had a personality problem. He didn't get along with people very well. And the commander is a guy by the name of Horatio Gates, who his men called Granny Gates. Um, and Granny Gates wants to just kind of stay and wait for the British to attack him. And Benedict Arnold's like, no, we must attack, attack. And he's like, nope. Arnold gets so angry that Horatio Gates orders his second in command, Benedict Arnold, to be under arrest. And he confines him to quarters. The battle starts. Benedict Arnold's sitting there, he's going crazy. He's like, there's a battle going on without me. So he disobeys orders. Comes out of his tent, gets on a horse, and he rides from scene to scene, rallying American forces, and they defeat the British. He gets shot in the leg, but thanks to him, we win probably the most important battle, the Battle of Saratoga, because after that, the French decide to be our allies and give us support. And of course, all of that to say, Benedict Arnold doesn't get any credit. The credit goes to everybody else, and he resents it, and he basically sells his sword to the British. Now, I want you to imagine you're George Washington. This is like, your, he's top gun, right? He's the man. 
And now he's betrayed you. And he was your friend. Does George Washington quit? Does he say, the war's over, I'm a failure, we give up, we've lost our best? How many times have you heard that in a sports team, in a business, whatever, where somebody quits or leaves or is injured and everybody else goes, well, we might as well give up because he or she isn't here anymore. Not George Washington. He picks himself up and he keeps on fighting, even without his buddy who becomes his enemy. A couple other things here. Constitutional Convention, they choose George Washington to preside over the convention. It's like herding feral cats. <laughs> I don't know if that means anything to you, but I grew up working on farms and there were always cats that did not like you and they would kind of peek out and hiss at you and that's about as close as you'd get. I mean, that's the Constitutional Convention. You got guys fighting over slavery, over representation, and they're all saying, I'm gonna go home if I don't get my way. And somehow George Washington has to hold them together. He gets the name, the indispensable man, because he's the only one who had the character that all the different people who disagreed, they all trusted him. Here's a question I always ask my students. Are you the indispensable man or woman? In other words, when you walk into a room, do people go, that's a person that has so much character that I'll follow them whatever they decide because they've proven themselves to be an honorable person. Is that you? Are you the indispensable man or woman? That's George Washington. And then when he becomes president, I mentioned this before, he puts together a cabinet of advisors. But we're not done with failure. Remember, our point is, you don't just fail once in life if you're a hero. You fail over and over. He puts together the two brainiacs, Jefferson, probably, I, I think probably one of our greatest intellects, the only one who could match him, Alexander Hamilton. And he takes them as advisors in the first couple of years, it goes okay. But soon they, they discover they don't agree on things and they begin to butt heads. So much so, guess what? We're gonna get our first two political parties from this. And things go so bad, people begin to criticize George Washington, the indispensable man. The last couple of years of his presidency, he's like, I, I don't want it. I didn't even want this job, right? I already, already did the revolution, did the French and Indian War. I'm doing you a favor here. But people start criticizing him. Even Jefferson behind his back begins to criticize him. And today we talk about the media, right? Oh, how the media attacks people. And we've never seen anything like that before in history. You're wrong. There was a, a secret media war led by Jefferson to destroy Washington's party, the Federalist. And they got really vicious, right? Adams, they called the, his rotundancy, right? Because he was a little chunky. Um, they, they, I, I won't get into all the things, but there was a lot of attacks. What's going on now is it new? There really isn't anything new under the sun. What's important is that Washington doesn't quit. This other chance, and so I, I wanna wrap up with this. Matthew 24, 13 says, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. If you wanna overcome failure in your life, the message from George Washington is don't quit. Don't quit. He had so many opportunities, so many failures. To, he could have quit, but he didn't. And then the thing was, then another problem would come and he didn't quit. And then another problem came and he didn't quit. I sum it up with one of his, his favorite generals was a guy by the name of Nathaniel Green. What's wild about this general is Washington put him in charge of the Southern campaign to fight the British and he lost every single battle, every single battle, but he won the war in the South. He eventually, by losing, draws the British General Cornwallis to a place called Yorktown, where the British will surrender. Now imagine being the general who never won a battle, <laughs> but still won the war. And here's what he told his men, because they were getting discouraged, losing battle after battle. And this is my favorite quote. If you walk into my room, you will see this up near my door. It says, we fight, we get beat, we rise, and we fight again. Let me repeat this, I, I love this. We fight, we get beat, we rise, and we fight again. So in conclusion, here's what I, I want you to take away from this talk on Washington, that if you wanna live a heroic life like Washington, recognize that life is a choice, and you can either determine your life based on your weaknesses and say, 
I, I'm too weak. I, I, I can't do this. Look, I didn't have the training. I give up. Or you can overcome your deficiencies. And you also have a choice when you fail and to say, I quit and I give up. Or you can overcome your failures. That's the story of George Washington.